is meant to be a discussion. I've come up with a few um, proposals and I've also put together a few slides to describe the subject slash problem I want to put up for discussion. Um, so for your information, this is kind of open-ended. Um, they've put a really long slot at this. I've already asked if I have to fill that, otherwise they'll hang me, but they won't. So, you know, by the time everybody's bored, we can just go home and can also stick around as long as you like. Um, so the subject is digital sovereignty. And, well, I have a little agenda. And I'm sorry, I was earlier thinking that, you know, inside tech jokes are not really good. Um, and I bet many here even don't. That, so I'm sorry. So I'm first going to talk about well issues with digital sovereignty, what the problem is, where the cloud went wrong, and after that I'm essentially going to open it up. I have a few statements and discuss. So where cloud went wrong. Now I don't know how many of you are have seen this image, but I thought it was kind of fascinating. Um, this is the movement of the US president, as could apparently be quite easily gathered from public data sources on where mobile phones were, including the mobile phones of his security team. Now, this is, well, first of all, quite a, uh, I think, embarrassing thing for the US, uh, but it also tells, says something about how hard it is to protect your privacy in our society, because this is probably one of the best protected people in the world, and, you know, is off. So, in other words, there is a bit of a privacy issue. Yeah, I think um, this is Nest, and Google had put in a microphone, but then apparently they didn't know that it was recording everything. I don't know if I believe them, but it's still quite an amazing thing to have happened, which it really did. I have one last one. This is a secret U.S. military base in, I think, Afghanistan. How this image was made? Well, from the public data of a sports tracker, which was used by the servicemen walking around on that base. Again, holy macaroni, how is this possible? Yeah, this is because nobody cares about privacy anymore, and then this is what happens. And by the way, this was not a mistake. They did not take the data down. They just said, look, you know, maybe you shouldn't have used a sports tracker if you were in a secret military base. Okay, yeah, sure, fair enough. Like, targeting of companies based on all that data that we don't care about apparently anymore as a society is pretty extreme. Yeah, Facebook um, sent a mail around in Australia at some point where they told people a little hypothetical story to sell their services. And the story pretty much went like this. You know, look, if there's a teenager, you know, and has asked, uh, let's say, it, has asked someone else out for a date, um, we know exactly when he or she is essentially maximum nervous about the date that's coming, so that at just the right time, we can present them with a nice ad for, I don't know, a perfume or a leather jacket, so that they're most likely to buy. Isn't it awesome? Please buy our advertisement. I think it's amazingly creepy, but they're right. They have this information. Now, I do think they're heavily overselling their ability to actually monetize that. It's a whole different conversation for another day. They do have this information. Good at now, with that information, you can do all kinds of things. I mean, we know what happened to the elections in the US and the company that was doing that in the UK. They had made a really interesting psychological model and thought it's psychology, so I found it quite interesting. They had essentially determined that people who score... So, so what they did... I don't know how many of you are familiar with the big... It's a personality test with, like, five main metrics. There's, like, anxiety and... Well, four others, but the interesting one is anxiety. The thing is, people who score high on anxiety, they're more likely to vote conservative. People who score low on it are more likely. And, you know, that's bloody useful information. If you're running a campaign and you want to keep a portion of the people home and have another to go vote and all that stuff, 
So they use that. And again, how would they know this information? Well, they could get that from that's that's pretty damn personal. It's also really interesting. So Target, a US retailer, they um, had some automated advertising set up. These advertisement algorithms would learn automatically certain patterns in customers' behavior. So at some point, they started to advertise certain shampoos to women who were pregnant, including some who didn't even know yet that and they would send them a free gift packet with like baby stuff. And people would come and say, what the heck? Well, you know, if you start buying certain things, that can be because you're pregnant. Uh, one example was women who are pregnant they start to become more sensitive to smells. So they start to buy less strong smelling soap and other personal hygiene products. And therefore, oh, clearly that person suddenly starts buying this less strong smelling shampoo. Let's send them a nice packet. But they might not yet know. And their family might not know they're pregnant. They might be trying to hide it from their family. There's a problem here, don't you think? So again, and, and this was nobody trying to do anything evil. It's just, you know, automated algorithms screwing people's lives. I mean, I can make a really long list. And I think many of you in the room probably are familiar with these three. And, you know, I can make them. And the thing is, this is not even the subject of what um, because this is privacy, and we've been talking about privacy here in Germany and certainly in our community for quite a while, and I've been giving talks about it for quite a while, a long list of examples. But at least there's a bit of awareness now, and there's a GDPR and there's other stuff, and th there is some awareness now. Of this. Delete Facebook, hashtag is actually becoming... I, I want to try and bring this to a more, call it strategic level. And that's what digital sovereignty is. Uh, this is about what we do as a society, as, as a government, as businesses. Yeah. The thing is, these guys, they have really changed how businesses be. Uh, in, in a lot of ways. And, and they're threatening a lot of individual privacy. But these companies are doing different things. What they are doing is they're changing business of other businesses. They're essentially B2B companies. I mean, yeah, you as a consumer go there, but they are in between you and another company that's trying to sell up. Do you know what percentage Booking.com gets on a hotel that you book? Does anyone here have a rough idea? Yeah, it's about 30. Oh, that's huge. I mean, do you realize how much that is? There's no way that what they're doing, which is running a bloody website, costs anywhere near that, right? Their margins are insane. But how the heck can they ask so much? Well, can you afford not being on Hotel.com or Booking.com or TripAdvisor? No, you can't, so you just have to give that. Uh, what does that do to hotels in Europe? That essentially their profits are being move to the US, where all these companies are from, of course. Yeah, and these hotels, they cannot really do a lot of interesting things anymore. They have to cut costs. And you know, when you cut costs, you're not doing a lot of innovation. Now, I know maybe hotels don't do that much innovative things these days. I don't know. Motel one a lot, though. But of course, if you're talking about, well, there are other companies that uh, do interesting things. And what this model does is it essentially turns hotels almost into a franchise. Yeah, You know what the model of a franchise is? I mean, the people who do the work get very little money, and the people who don't do the work, they get the money. That's what a franchise is. I can go in more details, but this is what happens. And, you know, Okay, if this happens to hotels, I mean, we'll survive. Our hotels might be a little crappier, but our society will be. What about these companies? Yeah, and this is what Europe's economy is running on, right? And companies like, well, 
Android Auto and Uber and whoever else are going to build or is working with them to build self-driving cars, they are essentially going to get a business model that's probably similar to Booking.com because they bloody well know how much money there is made that way. And these companies will not be making much profit anymore and they will not be innovating anymore. And neither will any of the companies that deliver to them. And, well, I guess we can all kind of imagine what that will do to the European economy. And this is of course, not just Europe, this is any country in the world that is facing this very same situation. Yeah? There's a huge amount of profit essentially going to be extracted from local, hopefully still innovative industries. Um, that's all going to be made by these US companies. Because if, if Uber manages to become the global taxi company, with their own billions, that's for very If they become the booking.com of taxis, then every taxi will be an Uber. And Uber is probably going to buy cars, not just in the hundreds of thousands, but in the millions. And as a negotiation position for these companies, it's not going to be particularly great anymore. Hence, very little profit, hence well, we're all uh, afraid. So the next round of interesting things that's happening in tech has a lot to do with big data, with data in general, uh, AI and all that stuff. And all that data is not where it's produced. Yeah? I mean, I made this kind of eyeballing some statistics. But later I saw a statistic that only 3% of the data that's generated in the EU stays in the EU. I think that thing there in the middle should then be one tiny little ball. And most of our data is in the US, and to a growing degree. Uh, China is... And not here. So if you want to build an AI company and you need a lot of data for that, well, Silicon Valley is your place. We don't have that data anymore, we've given it... Well, the all the car companies are working hard on self-driving cars, and at the same time they're given Android Auto and Apple's car thingy all the data that these companies will need to be able to build a self-driving car, much better than our car companies. So, with all that data, what you can do, right, there's, there's AI, um, but, well, there's more stuff you can do with it. An interesting point is that you can essentially control people's thinking. Yeah, I mean, I talked a little bit about them when I was talking about privacy, because if you're a Facebook, uh, you know an awful lot about people, and you can really steer them in a certain direction. And I, I'm not sure how good it is for all of us if foreign countries can steer. I mean, when I talk about privacy, I often explain to people what the biggest drivers are behind people's decisions and their motivations and their ideas about it. And the thing is, of course, your beliefs about the world drive your behavior. Yeah, if you think that, I don't know, uh, flying is dangerous, then you will be afraid to fly. Like your belief has an effect on what you do. But where do your beliefs come from? Well, you think it comes from what you read and the facts and things you've heard and read and stuff, and that, that's true to some degree. You know, sociologically speaking, most, the best predictor of people's opinions is the opinions of the people around them. Friends, family. And how do you get the opinions of your friends? Facebook, WhatsApp. Yeah, th these companies control our opinions way more than we can ever imagine they do. And, and, and who's to say that, that Facebook cannot just change your timeline, because, I mean, God knows how that is created anyway, right? They can just put certain positive for them news a little bit higher and negative things a little bit lower, lower. and, you know, if they just do this 2-3% difference, they can nudge elections, and nobody will ever know. This is just a bloody dangerous thing. And I mean, of course, right now there are kind of two models in which this power over people's thinking is being used. Uh, there's one model where it's used to make you want things and buy them. And that's the capitalist model. And there's a, well, let's call it a little more dictatorial, where this knowledge is being used to control 
what you think about, well, those who are controlling. And, you know, on a global scale, don't we, do we want either of these to be controlling what we in Europe do? I and of course, there's a lot of fighting now happening, you know, like, I think Adobe had to, uh, or Adobe did shut off Venezuela from their services. Kind of sucks if you're a design agency there. I need these days there anyway. Uh, of course, there's a lot of fighting now, but you away. I mean, the stakes are really going up. Eh? Chinese companies are now also really gathering data and, well, censoring. These guys are pretty upfront about it and they have an interesting way of doing that. But, you know, who is controlling that? It's, it's these companies and their jurisdictions. And again, they're invariably not European. So, yeah, I don't know. I think there's an issue. And digital sovereignty is a term that's used to describe this issue. And that's also the name under which I'd like to put it. Uh, let's talk about it. I mean, what should we do? Because the reason, of course, we're having this discussion here is I think open source has a bit of a role to play. I mean, we were just talking about licenses um, and, and who to work with. And I have a bunch of probably bad ideas about what, what open source could do. I mean, you know, we're building tools to help people's privacy, to decentralize. That's what we do at Nextcloud, of course. That was Matrix. That's what Mattermost does. That's what what lots of others do. I mean, can we do more here? Is this the right thing to do in the first place? I don't know. Is there anyone else who wants to say something about this? Because I can keep talking, but... You mentioned in your previous talk about Silicon Valley and venture capitalists and things. Mm -hmm. If you're a European company that's done really well at fundraising and got maybe 20 million euros to try and change some bit of the world with some software and your competitors just raised 20 billion US yes. do you really have a hope of changing the world against that juggernaut yeah that's definitely I think one of the issues I think there are other people here who would agree that that raising money here in Europe is just amazingly much harder and that the limits that some governments put on are really stifling innovation. I mean, even if you have a really good idea, it can be amazingly hard to, to get funding here. Um, even if it's a... Um, so, I mean, one of the things that... that I put them in the order anymore but one of the things that i've been thinking about is also like should we let government solve this i mean governments are waking up right i don't know how many of you have heard of gaia x yeah so so gaia x is a german government thing uh led by a minister who might not be the most popular here but um the idea is to build an alternative to american cloud services and then i'm meaning the, the amazon web services and uh, the Google Apps, plat uh, not the Google Apps platform, but the Google Cloud, you know, where you can run your apps. And I think it's a good idea. I also think that it looks to me a bit like another attempt at providing, I don't know, government money to a bunch of companies who are already addicted to it. Uh, I actually wrote an opinion piece that I published, I think, yesterday, saying that Gaia X shouldn't have a budget if it wants to be successful. Because otherwise it just gets companies in who just want some money to do something fun and don't care about actually getting anything. Uh, but um, I don't know, you can debate whether government should do this or whether we should do this or both or neither. Or, But of course in the funding area that's something com government can change. Uh, we can change the rules here and change things. Um, something I wanted to mention in this... Um section is um, we have the problem also with, um, with, with Microsoft and this is Office 365. Mm -hmm. So um, as somebody working in research, we are not allowed to use cloud services at all. Um, obviously, people still do it because Google Docs or some stuff is just too 
nice to use it. Yes. And we don't have any um, alternative, which we, as I mean, there's some stuff we can host ourselves and so, but most of them, I mean, yeah, obviously Nextcloud brings, <laughs> brings it, but we, it's planned to introduce that, but we introduced GitLab, it took like oh, three years, so we are slow with stuff like that. Um, but the main problem for us is that, um, like, we still rely on this whole Microsoft world, as a lot of research organizations do, and we uh, rely on having Office. And now they said they just won't sell us any local copies. We have to go to their cloud, and we are not allowed to do this by law. Yeah. So um, you see, this is a problem. And um, I just talked to our... Um, CTO, a technical officer from all of DLR, and he talked to those of other res uh, research facilities, and they were all like, yeah, we know we are standing there, and we're not allowed to use this, but come on, we can't do anything about it. They have to change the law. So currently yeah, yeah. we have the problem that, <laughs> yeah, they, these companies yeah. have the power to, by just not doing anything, just going their way, to uh, influence kind of German and European laws regarding security of research data just because there's no alternative capable or which is accepted to. I mean, we are really so deep in the net of Microsoft. It's the only thing I can say about that is that it's true for every area and not this completely screwed up relationship. Quick to fail worse than the banks. Yeah, exactly. It's it's law legal. Yeah, I mean this this is indeed to fix this. You need government to actually enforce the law, which is amazing. But if they would, the problem would actually get solved because obviously the Europe Europe could make Microsoft um, force to they could force Microsoft to release their cloud hosted software as a piece of software that could be hosted by say Ionos. Yeah, that, that would be possible. I mean, obviously they could, but they don't want to because, of course, then they don't make their nice profits. And the European Union fails to actually put its foot down on this one because, well, you know, lobbying and all these nice trips to places where you get training and whatever. How So we might be circling back to enforcement straight away, but um, I would say that the most ambitious uh, regulatory attempt to do something about this would be GDPR, which came out of Europe. Do you think that's moving the needle in any way? I, I think the GDPR is hugely successful and hugely influential, which is also why you see it being adopted everywhere. I mean, California just introduced a similar law. It's not the same. There are differences, but it's, it's vaguely similar or f f fairly similar, and other countries are doing the same thing. Um, and I, I think that, so there's a, a slightly similar law coming, I think that the EU is working on, um, like cybersecurity something something, which is supposed to do a thing a little bit similar to the GDPR, where the GDPR enforces privacy, and privacy of course only relevant for individuals, not for companies. And the cybersecurity law is trying to do something similar, but then for companies and their data. Companies have no privacy. I mean, that's a huge concept, not a... Um, and, and I think, yeah, that those, uh, the government and, and the EU in general can play a role in this, and, and there are people pushing for this. There are various lobbying efforts, etc. But you can imagine, I mean, Microsoft is involved in Gaia-X. It's completely like, are you kidding me? Why? Of course they are, because they're involved everywhere. Uh, so whenever an organization that has any kind of actual influence tries to make any statement in any direction, the pressure to make sure that it doesn't actually harm the business of these companies. And again, it makes sense. Eh? They're too big to fail. If, if Germany would enforce the law, then nobody can work online anymore. And Well, the fact that people then say, oh, we need to fix the law is... We just need to make sure that Microsoft doesn't think they get away with it. But the thing is, of course, until now, we've always shown them that they can get away with it. Dutch government is in the same situation. They had, um, some time ago, was a report that 
uh, Office was sending essentially what you type to the Microsoft server. So then the Dutch government, of course, is very upset about that. You know, it should not be happening and they can't turn it off. Microsoft said, yeah, we'll, we'll make a fix. Uh, and then they promised to have a fix in six months. And they didn't. And it took another six. Are you kidding me, right? I mean, a lot of engineers in the room to disable something that just sends the keystrokes to a server in the US that does not take. It was not necessary for fun. So if so, so if GDPR is a success, um, now I know that several of the free software organizations in Europe um, did lobby for GDPR. In fact, I remember that in Germany specifically, there was actually a commentary round where the government asked organizations in general to provide input. Uh, at the time, I was on the board of KDE EV, and we did put a comment in there. So I guess... The question would be what we can learn from that process, how we can scale it up, how we can be more active in the next round, and what follow-up steps would be to replicate that. Yeah, I mean, do what you just say, indeed. Um, I mean, I, I know there are some, some people trying to get together and, and set up a lobbying organization at the level about FSFE is, of course, active in this area. I would say, generally speaking, follow their lead, uh, support them in this kind of stuff. And there are people paid to low. I think the FSF has some. I mean, yeah, and, and there are, of course, other organizations doing so far. I mean, I, I see a role, honestly. Because I, I do think that the role of. This is a product at a level that you can't solve it, I think. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have one question or, or rather remark. Um, you had this one slide up with booking.com and uh, uh, what I've, for me is kind of fascinating is uh, that I learned way back that the internet kind of cuts out the middleman, uh, meaning there's yeah. business can go directly to consumers. Uh -huh. And now, suddenly, with platforms, we have basically a pullback where um, the middlemen, in, well, basically, middlemen inject themselves. Uh, and, and for me, it's kind of fascinating with TreatWell, I think it's called. Um, I, I do an appointment directly with my hairdresser, but now I'm supposed to go through a new middleman um, that somehow yeah, provides this service for me. And I guess it adds some value, quote unquote, in some form. Um, for a while. But um, yeah. yeah, it's just, uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, well, I think the model of these is the same everywhere. I mean, the example you give, yeah, the hairdresser thinks, oh, there is now this really nice service that I don't need to handle these appointments anymore. And they just charge, I don't know, 3%. Uh, so I'm going to send my customers there so that they make an appointment there. And I mean, the worth it, right? Because I'm spending way more to handle this myself. Yeah, and then 10 years from now, when everybody's always using that website, then of course the price goes to 30% and your hairdresser. And this is the business model of these companies, and it's amazingly transparent and everybody. I, that's why these companies are spending so much money to get into this position. I mean, the amount of money, like billions, as it came to the funding point that was made earlier, they're throwing enormous amount of money at this to get into this position of being the middleman you cannot skip. And then they can extract amazing profits. And as, as a consumer, you don't, e you don't even see it because Booking.com forbids the hotels from offering a lower price on their own website. I mean, and with car companies, I've, I've asked a few times at Europe Car, like, hey, you know, if, if I just go to your website, I see higher prices than what I see on, on the various car rental sites. They say, yeah, that's, that's true. You should book there. Yeah, it's really nice for them. I want to ask a little bit about how we define success in this story. Mm -hmm. Because we talk about like GDPR being successful. I, I've worked in or an organization that was implementing GDPR. Oh, and that's horrible. In, in the pay. process. 
we spoke with a lot of other engineering companies, and frankly, the way people were implementing GDPR made almost no difference to the end consumer, and yet we were compliant. So I would challenge the fact that we call GDPR successful, and I'm wondering what does success actually look like for the consumer, and at what cost are we, how do we want to cost this out? Because GDPR is extremely expensive to implement, and I think in some places it hasn't done what we hoped it would. So I'm wondering how do we want to price this out as well, and how do we want to convince people that this is worth the cost? Because I think in a lot of people's minds it's about what do, what do I get as a consumer out of this? They don't necessarily see the, the bad parts of, of losing uh, access to their data. So how do we convince people that this is, this is worth it? How do we motivate people? Um, yeah, and how do we talk about success in this, this realm? So, Sorry, that's a lot of things in one yeah, go. <laughs> absolutely. So the first point you made is like in, in a bunch of engineering companies, you saw that it was implemented in a way that you don't think it consumer any benefit. But then if that's the case, are you sure it's GDPR compliant? Absolutely, 100%. I sat in rooms with lawyers, saying experts saying, yes, yes, you're compliant, this is fine. Really? And part of it had to do with the fact that if you knew that you weren't compliant, but said that you would be compliant, that's enough. Yeah, but that's a temporary fix. Sure, but if everyone's doing that, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people are doing it, yeah, then it's not, it's not actually doing what, you know, what the law says and what people are reading into it as. But that, that's a temporary thing, and I think it's totally legit for a law that is as impactful as a GDPR to have a, call it a grace period. But I don't know about you, but I regularly see pretty hefty fines already being handed out for the GDPR, and those fines are going up. Of course, you also have to keep in mind that the companies you're probably talking about were not primarily the companies that the GDPR tries to get in line. Yeah, the target of the GDPR was to make, well, some people would go as far as to say that the goal of the GDPR was to make the business model of companies whose primary business model is to essentially abuse people's data in an arguably immoral way, impossible argue it failed at that, but it's it sure made failed it harder. <laughs> no, I think it definitely made it harder. Um, and companies, smaller companies, were never meant to get too much hardship. That part perhaps failed in some ways. I think a lot of companies are very afraid of it. Um, I mean, I implemented the GDPR largely at Nextcloud. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a bunch of work, but I think it does you know, it's like the GDPR or the GPL compliance in a company, you know, getting your compliance in order is a pain in the ass. But once you've got shit in order, it's actually better for everyone. And I think in that regard, GDPR enforces a kind of hygiene. Right. So again, I would argue that what's missing is a success criteria that matters. So, I mean, I'm speaking like an engineer. I talk about goals and success mm. criteria. But if, if everybody implements GDPR perfectly, but no consumer actually executes their right to withhold data or to delete data, or mm -hmm. like it's not successful then. Well, the goal was, of course, yeah. I like there's no point in doing it if no one. But the goal was, of course, not to make everybody remove their data from this people the ability to do so if they want it. Right. So, and of course, the reality is that only a small percentage Cares right. So if you if you look at the costs then involved, yeah. you know if one percent or 0.1 percent of consumers are actually exhibiting control over their data, yeah. versus the impact to the economy in a sense, like it seems like we're not uh, people people don't yet understand the cost to them for not having control over their data. Otherwise, more people would be. That's true. But once they realize that, the systems that companies are now actually in place to give them what they want, which is control over their data, and that was not the case a few years ago. But yeah, I know what you mean. Um, so I, think I, I, I think the GDPR has done a lot um, in, in terms of awareness and in terms of actually making sure that companies 
deal in the right way with data, or at least better, maybe not always in the right way. And it has definitely been a hit to Facebook. I mean, hey, they did not grow for like two quarters or something. Of course, it didn't fix the problem of the dominance of these companies and their business models. That's true. Um, so yeah. I, guess I, I guess part of what I'm saying is I think we need to be smarter about how we motivate people to take control of their data and not yeah. just pass regulation red tape. I, I think there are That's two sides enough. to it, though. I think part of it is just with the lobbying we talked about earlier. I mean, obviously, the GDPR went through the same process. And whatever law we will push through that tries to address either digital sovereignty or privacy or related issues is going to get watered down to quite a point by really heavy lobbying. Um, the same awareness, I mean, a lot of people just don't fun fundamentally don't get it. I mean, recently I managed to actually get through to my dad for, I think, the first time ever when it comes to privacy, because I told him at some point, you know, he has a pacemaker, and I told him, look, you know, would you accept a pacemaker from your doctor when you knew that not a single doctor in the Netherlands would be willing to use that brand of pacemaker? And he was like, no. I said, well, if I tell you that pretty much no, or that most security people, you know, exercise their right or care about privacy or don't put their stuff at Gmail, would you then agree that maybe there's a problem with it? The first time he said, huh, yeah, maybe. You know, but it's it's hard to to get this into people, and that's not going to succeed ever completely either. So, like solving the problem, I don't know. That's we're never going to solve the problem completely, but we might avoid having a complete meltdown by fighting it. Yeah, I think this is really a great and important discussion and <clears throat> I would say that the problem is too big to to look at uh, the single point of solution, so to speak. So I think it's a, it needs a very broad approach. It's uh, about policy making, it's about deciding whether children should be taught uh, how to uh, how to uh, deal with a Microsoft product or if they should in general learn about the technology behind it. If we let Microsoft into the schools, we shouldn't be uh, surprised that uh, they get such a lot of power. So I think in the process of education, uh, you have to make influence, you have to... I mean, we, we are all, I think, uh, activists in that scene, so I don't have to tell you what we all should do together. But I think uh, we should be aware that it needs our common effort to make a change because the problem is so big that we cannot as a single entity or approach uh, fight against these powers and money flows. And I think money flow is also a very important issue. I think for most of the topics, for example, let's say Microsoft Office. I mean, what are they doing? How are people using this product? what they are actually offering, most, I would say, 80 to 90 percent of what people actually need from that is already available as free software. Why are people not using it? I don't know. And what do we have to do uh, to make this happen? No, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Let, I let wish just I make did. One more, two more points, please. Uh, one is that economy is an important issue. I think uh, we, we need to lobby for more people to be willing to pay for free software because economy is key to everything. <laughs> and I don't understand why people are not willing to pay much less than they are paying for proprietary software than they are willing to pay for free software. And the second thing is the products have to be better. I mean, the what we are delivering as free software must also... Uh, be com more competitive in the sense of usability and stuff like that. And I think in that case, it may also be helpful to join forces. I mean, maybe sometimes at, from a strategic point of view, it's not so clever to start the so and so many project of the same in the same field, but really to 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 join forces and try to improve 
pro products that are or projects that are already around. I mean, for if you think about XMPP or chat, for example, why the hell? I mean, how could that happen? Why are we? Why are people using WhatsApp instead of Java? I mean, what's the difference? You you chat with other people, but obviously because the the client was more appealing, use usable, uh, more colorful, better design. I don't know, but I think that's what, what, what we need to continue to do. Yeah, I think a lot of it um, boils down indeed to the economic side. I mean, can talk long about well, we talked about business models in the previous talk, and I think that's. Definitely a part of it. Um, we need to do better in, in the open source community in building businesses. Honestly, I, I, I mean, I'm doing it, right? And it's, it's addressing that it works and how well it works. And I see just too many companies, well, I don't know, as a super general tip, I would say stop doing so much consulting and focus more on subscriptions. And I know it's really hard, it's much harder to sell up subs subscription and consulting, but it's consulting isn't going to get you anywhere. I mean, we, we say no to consulting projects, even if they are very profitable, because it doesn't work. And every hour we spend on consulting, we're not spending on, well, essentially something that will benefit the subscription. Now, I'm happy to talk about that in private to people, about how you can move your company from consulting to subscriptions, etc. But it, this is, I think, a key. And this will have an effect on the quality of the products. Because what, what I don't like, personally, I am often asked even by people, like, hey, do you want to we want to donate to Next. You know, we're using it as a company, we're happy to donate. And I always say, I don't want your donation. I want your business. Yeah, I, I want to be able to provide a service that you want to pay for. Otherwise, I don't want a few euros thrown in my direction because that's not going to sustain my business. So I don't really want to convince people that they should pay as much for open source as to pay for proprietary per se. Um, I, I do think that there is an awareness thing that needs to be done. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, there is this um, bigger awareness in some areas of the market where people do software development together, they realize it is smart to contribute because it helps their business in the long run. And a similar thing, I think, needs to happen in the industry that companies need to realize that um, you should get a subscription for the software that you use because it will help you in the long run with a more reliable, better service. Not because you're being nice and donating, because, but just directly because it benefits you as a business. And yes, on a slightly longer term thinking than three months, but so I think it's more of an awareness, and it's more about com getting companies to realize. And I think all of that will indeed help and strengthen open source in general, which will also be helpful, I think, for industry. Now, bringing it a little bit closer to digital sovereignty, one thing that I find amazing is that if you just think about how much money is being paid for just make the top five of proprietary American software vendors and what the open source community and businesses could do with that money. I mean, we're at Nextcloud. Partners have built a product that exactly one-on-one stuff. We've done it at a percentage of that. Put that in numbers. To It would be government to actually start to take open source serious, purchase it, and that will just change the whole equation because a big part boils down. It, for a company like us, it's amazingly hard to sell to government. And it's amazingly easy for Microsoft. To yes, part of it is because for every one salesperson hour, they can bring in a can of 50 salespeople to convince the customer. And of course, they don't ever want to lose a serious deal because, well, their reputation is on the line. And oh my God, if they would lose one deal, they will do everything to make sure that everybody, uh, that it goes wrong. I mean, we have all seen that. Um, but this is, in the end, also a, a purchasing decision at government. Oh, and then, yeah, there's a bit of a too big to fail, right? If government would stop using Microsoft Office tomorrow, then the economy of Europe would probably grind to a halt. 
But you know what? If Trump has a bad day and decides that you know Microsoft is no longer allowed to offer services to Europe, our economy also grinds to a halt. Is this really the situation we want to be in? Are you freaking kidding? Uh, this is just a ridiculous amount of dependence we have. And just purely the fact that if you realize that, then would still argue for, yeah, okay, but we need to change the law to allow it. Anyway, any more? Yes. Does the Digital Sovereignty Project plan to do awareness raising for the benefits of on-premise self-hosted software? Is that part of the goals of the project? So the question is which project you're talking about? Digital Sovereignty is in the website. It, ah, the, the website, yeah. I, there is a website, digitalsovereignty.org, but that one's mine together with Frank, um, but that's not as much of a project as it is just a website where we hope to get opinions of various people um, together. No. Um, but everyone who posts there be able to espouse their own agenda or opinion. That they don't have to necessarily mesh with minds or certainly not. Um, as long as they are not, I want to say shills, but uh, obviously there are people I wouldn't. I have not advertised this site. I don't really plan on doing that, but yeah, digital. Post those opinions. Any more? Yeah. Mm, yeah, you mentioned that it's hard to convince the government. Well, to buy it. Just buy it. To I don't. Buy it. Because if you want to, sorry for that, I had it on mute. Um, because if you want to build a good product, you need to have some pressure that aligns your work with the market. And if you just get random money from the government, you're not going to build a good product ever, I'm sorry. So the government should pay for a service that they need and that helps them. Otherwise, I don't want their money. So my That's my okay, opinion. Thanks. My question is... Uh, <clears throat> um, the, the Ministry of Economic... Germany uh, initiated this project called Gaia X, which I mm -hmm. heard, or I guess, Nextcloud is involved with. Yes. So it would be very interesting to hear your uh, your, your opinion on that. Mm. So, um, well, first of all, let me then plug it again because I actually wrote that opinion piece I mentioned earlier about Gaia X. That's on digitalsovereignty.org. Uh, but I know it's also been circled around in the German government uh, because, well, interesting enough, they like my opinion. Uh, so, the idea of GaiaX is to build this alternative, right, for US clouds. But they want to do this in a distributed way. So, as a, well, let's say semi techy person for a minute, what I kind of think is what they're going to come out of is to have a single standard stack, let's say open stack ish, some orchestration, uh, Kubernetes or stuff like that, some stack that different cloud vendors can run um, and that has enough standardization that if you run your application container in place X, you can migrate very easy and quickly to place Y. Maybe even there's a single portal uh, you go to I don't know, GaiaX.com, you say, okay, I need a Nextcloud server. I want to host it in, at a German provider in a data center in Munich. Okay, here are the vendors. Click, pay, your app is running. Yeah. 
such a platform. It's essentially what Amazon offers, except kind of decentralized, standardized, and you're... Now, again, I'm purely predicting what I feel the direction is, and whether they ever get there is a big question, to be honest, because, you know, it's built smart tech like that, usually. But if it would go that way, I think it's... And we have the technology for it to do this, right? I mean, all of you here can probably in a weekend put together, not a proof of concept per se, but describe how to build one. In this, this is technically not a, I mean, come on, OpenStack, all this stuff, Kubernetes, it exists, companies are building it, it's open source, you can deploy this. This is not a terribly hard thing to do. Um, I mean, I find it fascinating that one of Microsoft's strongest arguments against Gaia-X and digital sovereignty is that Europe can't do it. Because, you know, it's really difficult to build a cloud platform. Yeah, yeah, only we can do that. Uh huh. Anyway, I mean, I think this is not bad per se. But what I'm worried about is that the German government is going to say, okay, you know, we have, I don't know, 10 million or 20 to, to pay for the companies who have to implement it. And I think most of you can do a back of the envelope calculation, say, of 20 million, I can do this 50,000 times. Yeah? And that's where, the pro that's where the problem will be. This is just going to get stuck in like a bunch of busy for a while and profits, right? That's why I made an argument. I said, let's just not give any money to it. But instead, maybe just say, look, two years from now, 20% or 10% of the German government's, European government's applications have to run on it. Now, there's an incentive, because without results, there's no money. Kind of the opposite of the usual way. Yeah, that's... Anyone? <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you very much for that. That was a great discussion. Yeah. <laughs>